Tonight on Joy News Prime, Parliament agenda setting on the controversial e-levy bill to allow for broader consultation after MPs exchanged hefty blows last night. The minority caucus in parliament dismisses claims Speaker Alban Bagwin has failed to demonstrate leadership in recent times following accusations by the majority that the absence of the Speaker last night formed part of a grand scheme by the NDC to frustrate government business. We do not see anything that the Speaker of Parliament is doing uh, which shows that he is not showing leadership. Also in this bulletin, World Health Organization recommends people cancel holiday gatherings as the Omicron COVID-19 variant continues to spread. An event cancelled is better than a life cancelled. And in business? Financial analyst proposes 12.5% VAT charge on service fees charged by telcos and bank transfers in place of the controversial e-levy. We'll hear from the finance uh, officer of the Valley of University, Dr. Williams Pepper. Probably, if the 1.75 is a problem, must use the VAT law to, to bring that one in. And in that case, it will not be a major issue. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limli. We are on DTT because we're free to air on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. We are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Please stay tuned in. Scenes from Ghana's parliament last night and not a boxing or wrestling ring. Parliament has adjourned sitting on the controversial e-levy bill to allow for a broader consultation. Chaotic events which ensued in the House yesterday forced an adjournment of proceedings to today. The House reconvened at 11 a.m. this morning with heavy security presence, characters uprising. Today's parliamentary proceedings Personnel from the Ghana Police Service and the National Security Agency were stationed at vantage points following a brawl in Parliament last night over the E-Levy uh, bill. Members of Parliament were screened before entering the chamber. Other plainclothes officers were seated in the press gallery. Takwan Swam MP George Murakuduka believes the atmosphere in the House warranted the level of security. There have been counter-allegations from both sides on what led to last night's chaos. But first, here's the news desk report chronicling events that ensued last night in Parliament. It was a free-for-all brawl by members of parliament, hands at each other's throats, throwing punches like boxers in the ring and ripping apart each other's shirts. This violent scene is playing out on the speaker's days as the MPs fight over the speaker's seat. The night had started with parliament requiring to vote on whether or not to take the controversial e-levy under a certificate of urgency. But Speaker Alvin Bagwing was nowhere to be found. If he did not return to his chair, then the MPP side will lose one vote, as the first Deputy Speaker, who was presiding, did not have a vote. Here is Deputy Majority Leader Afenyo Marke. In Parliament, leadership is consulted and is engaged. We have no information as to the whereabouts of Mr. Speaker. The leadership of the majority has not been informed of the reasons why Mr. Speaker is unavoidably absent this evening from the Chamber of Parliament. And we don't want to suggest that perhaps Mr. Speaker is unavoidably absent to frustrate government business. Minority Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak explains to PM Express that the Speaker may have retired for medical reasons. 
Let's let's not pretend that we in this house do not know that speaker is going through treatment. And definitely, speaker gets exhausted and will not be able to sit the whole day. With Speaker Alban Babwing absent and the MPP side determined to win the votes to have the e-levy considered under a certificate of urgency, First Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joe Sousu, was forced to preside, but that meant he could not cast a vote, leaving the MPP side one vote short. Without his vote, there would be a tie, and that will kill the motion. It was at this point that Joe Osowusu made the following declaration that triggered a long period of violence on the floor of parliament. And of members, because we don't have a division room, I'm advised that the agreement is that we'll all file out and then the yes will come and they are counted. After that, the no's will come and they are counted. But let me put on record that as soon as I leave the seat, I'm entitled to vote. Joe Sowusu then got up for his second deputy speaker to take over, fearing that he may be going out to actually cast his ballot. The NDC MPs charged onto the speaker's days to seize his seat so the second deputy speaker could not sit down. The MPP side charged back and the two sides clashed. And after a long break, the second deputy speaker returned to make the following announcement. Honourable members, under the circumstances, we are joining the House of tomorrow, 9 o'clock in the forenoon. Well, contrary to speculations that the first deputy speaker, Joseph Uso, left his seat to take part in yesterday's vote, which led to acrimonious scenes in the chamber, Majority Leader Oseche Mensa Bonsu says the Bekwai MP rather wanted to excuse himself to take his medication because of ill health. The person, is it the case that a speaker can't even excuse himself to visit the loo? Is it the case? Was this the case? The this man, case? the man was indisposed. He was shivering. And he went to the clinic. The record is there. So we had to persuade him to come and sit. He was in the chamber and he was shaking like a leaf. We had to go and prevail on him to come and preside. Of course, if he's presiding, giving his own long tenure in parliament, his own understanding of the rules and procedures in Parliament. Um, we thought that we'd be able to navigate crisis periods much more with respect to the second deputy speaker, much more than the second deputy speaker. But it was getting too much for him. So he said he wanted to excuse himself, to take his medication, and then perhaps to come back if he felt okay, or perhaps maybe to sit somewhere. Just for clarity, so he was excusing himself not to come and engage in the voting that was going on? What, Is that a clarity? What, what, what if he did? What if he did to take his medication? He came, voting was not over, and he thought that because well, somebody else was presiding, he could participate in that. Yeah. What, what, what of that? Is that any illegality in that? There's no illegality. The question remains, why did the NDC MPs try to seize the Speaker's seat? MP for the Dodio Dionil and Tevandapoy has been justifying their actions. Well, in as much as I would say it's unfortunate that such a thing should happen, I think Ghanaians should put the blame on the first Deputy Speaker and the second Deputy Speaker. Our democracy and our parliamentary practice is at risk if they continue to exhibit such biased attitude. You all remember in this house when their famous recession of Honorable Babu's decision. Honorable Osewusu then, sitting in, said that he was counting himself among the quorum, but then he knows he has no vote. Today, he, Osewusu, is sitting in a chair and claiming that he still has a vote, even though he's presiding which is in contravention of the standing orders and the constitution of this Republic of Ghana. So we said that we will not allow him to vote. 
Because by sitting in the chair and presiding, he has no original vote, nor casting vote. No, no, by the time he was going to vote, he wasn't going to sit in the chair. Uh, he was leaving the chair and handing over uh, the chair to the second deputy speaker. So see, technically, he wasn't going to vote. Parker, when you are presiding, when you are presiding and order the division, and the division is ongoing, then you are getting out of the chair to go and exercise your vote. Where, where, where have you found this before? Where is this? Where, where? It's like you presiding a referee saying that, let me just wear the jersey of one team, play after that, I will come and continue as a referee. Have you seen that before? It doesn't make sense anywhere. And that's what we objected to. We are not going to allow Ose Usu to turn the constitution and the standing orders around to suit his whims and caprices. It is not right, it's unconstitutional, and it's very, very reprehensible for a speaker of this house to do what he did. You are blaming the first deputy speaker of parliament for what happened, but there are those who have said that. If you disagree with him, should that lead to violence? I saw you in the midst of the action, fighting we, your colleagues. We, 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 we didn't fight. We were principled in the fact that this man once said that as a first deputy speaker, he wasn't a speaker. It led to confusion. Today, too, he want to arrogate to himself a vote that by sitting in the chair and presiding, he didn't have. Should that lead to a fight? We couldn't have allowed Changing him. Changing We couldn't have allowed him to do what is was wrong. You all, you and I agree that the constitution that we all have ad agreed to govern us tells us that we have the right to prevent somebody from obtaining the constitution of the Republic of Ghana. And that's exactly what we did. We're not going to allow ourselves to, to, to obtain the constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Well, the man at the center of this commotion, the first deputy speaker of parliament, Joe Seusu, wants the MPs who engage in the fight on the floor identified and punished. Yes, what happened last night has left the chamber. Most of the time happened behind me. I saw, I see them in the video. But you can identify individuals. If you don't call out those individuals and hold them responsible for their actions and you lumber them together, Nothing will change. This is my fourth term in Parliament. It is only in this eighth Parliament that they have been violent. I, the first two Parliaments, um, I was with the minority. We objected strongly. We made that case strongly. We never accepted The worst we did was to work out in the chamber. So we should point out who are specifically seeking to disrupt proceedings. And before it gets to that, they show their intention. And they're all on camera. So we should point out those specific individuals and call them out. Jose Usu insists his role as a presiding member will not stop him from exercising his right to vote on any subject on the floor of parliament. The rules they themselves read of that, uh, 1193. They said that the person presiding will not have his original vote while presiding. So when you leave the seat, are you still presiding? And why can't I leave the seat? Yesterday, the speaker started until after about an hour and a half. He called me to come and take over from me. I was not feeling very well. So, Within one hour, I also asked the second deputy speaker to take over for me. This is a very class thing we do every day. We change, go back and change. I recall in 2018, around Christmas, I had gone home. It was around 2 a.m. when I was called. The proceedings are still going on. They need me to come and take over for me. The second speaker, at that time, was the second deputy speaker. I quickly changed and drove back to Parliament. So changing over is a regular feature in the work of uh, the speaker. At the point when we get to the division, the host proceedings are a new proceedings, refresh. And therefore, I can change over and then leave the seat 
for the uh, second division week after he had voted. And this was the cabinet secretary because of our current circumstances. The only advantage the majority has over minorities is one. The minority says until government broadens stakeholders' engagement on the controversial e-levy, it will continue to put up this posture. Minority leader Haruna Idrisu, however, says the minority is ready for talks to reach a compromise. But e-levy, we are unresolved, unequivocally, that we will not support it in its current form, character and nature. And yesterday, I sought to explain to you, ladies and gentlemen of the media, President Nanad Dankwa himself and the Minister of Finance do not even understand what they are doing. Ghanaians must be adequately informed that this tax even means 3.75% e-levy. It's not going to be 1% because currently Vodafone doesn't charge any percent. So if you don't even have, if you say MTN 1%, but 0.25, what about the other telecos? But more importantly, Ghanaians must understand that. President Akufuado doesn't understand the tax he's introducing. There is, is a mark of difference between charges on fees, even levies on fees, and charges and levies on transactions. So there is a, a disjuncture, even appreciating uh, the tax instrument you are introducing. The 0.25 is on fees, not transactions. You are introducing a levy on transactions. In fact, my strongest view, without fear of contradiction, you are going to make MTN richer. This is a windfall for them, because they will just shift away from charging fees, which are limited as thresholds of money. Save the definition of Oslo, who has to who a poor person is. I won't pay royalties to her. But at the UN level, you must earn at least $2 a day in order to qualify that you are not below the poverty line. So when we said I just up was the threshold, it was to mean that take away the core poor. I mean, can you imagine Momo on pensions, your father's pension, he's paying uh, tax on the transfer, and even more uh, unreasonable about it. You take money from your bank account, you pay 1.75%. You transfer the money into a Momo account, you pay 1.75%. The person transferred the person to a school fees of a or daughter, he pays 1.75 percent. So, it's in, anyway, what has happened in parliament is that yesterday, you see, parliament is not about a majority sitting at a Kumasi MPP conference where the president thinks that he has majority or a majority group. It's about those present in the chamber and voting and exercising that right. He must accept that Ghanaians voted for a hung parliament for him to deepen consultation and to reach out to the other side of the Ghanaian populace who don't want excessive partisanship and the bullying of it. For us, we are happy. We won't be bullied any longer as a minority party. But what do Ghanaians think about the conduct of their representatives in parliament lately? We took to the streets to find out. And that's the embarrassing aspect of it. Because I, 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 I know personally that um, in everything it deals with law. And then, as we said, the dialogue, or we just debate and then come out with substantive uh, um, issues concerning all these things. And then, at the end of the day, they draw a conclusion. So then, you, you also ask, why then did uh, Abambagwin also left uh, his seat? Just to make way for the uh, first uh, uh, deputy speaker to also come. So, so the minority was having an agenda, and the majority was also thinking that then there's something wrong somewhere. To the Crofono good parliament in our moon, and yet because as a woman to me, the attorney, what they are doing at the parliament is uncalled for. I used to have so much respect for parliamentarians, but not anymore. It's very disgusting. But as I said, I want my own say, easy, I'll grow up in a moon deal. Parliament will mean will be that since my mommy will be very we are see here to our baby our baby I'm to hear the same thing no more yeah and not sure the papa 40 parliament yeah yeah when you know the air the boom I this was rather unfortunate we thought parliament is supposed to be a place where we the citizens will sit down and watch with admiration so what do we see as what we saw yesterday was very unfortunate I'm expecting the two parties or the two caucus to sit down together 
and Jojo and come out with the best policy that will the nation. That's all. That, that is all that we are expecting. Me here, me mami tita kwa. Na me kose ni iskalam kotia. Na yes, one person mu kuya na. Do they want to kill us? My fridge is spoiled as a result of them so. And now E-Levy. I have lost respect for parliamentarians. We are sitting somewhere on my own parliament. On our own way. Just a minute, we are parliamentarians. Because on our own way, we are class system. So, also our own money is there. Now we are the enemy. For that, we are Ghana. Yeah. So, if they want to vote and they know they will fight, they should go to Bukuma Arena and stop destroying our properties. Because what they, what they are doing is very very poor. There is no sense in it. Why should a whole MP fighting over E Levy? You are the lawmaker and you are fighting. What do you expect me, the citizen, to do? You expect me to, to obey the rules and regulations in the country? No, I'm going to act more than what you are doing in the parliament. So they should advise themselves. It's very, very bad. The director of Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, Dr. Rashid Ramani, says parliamentarians should keep the lesson from the 2020 elections in mind as they go about their parliamentary business. According to him, Ghanaians are not satisfied with what has transpired in parliament from January to now. So for me, I go back to my starting point on January 7, that you know, they all have to carry every day the lessons from the 2020 elections uh, behind their minds each time they deal with each other. Uh, this is not a fifth parliament, this is not a sixth parliament, and this is not a seventh parliament. And I think the earlier they, they, they keep this in mind at all times, you know, the better. Because otherwise, uh, from some of the utterances that we hear from the minority side, if they say everything is going to be subjected to a vote, um, I don't see how the majority side can marshal the numbers every day uh, with some of our members of parliament performing executive duties and so on. Uh, with the kind of marriage that our constitution has imposed between the executive and the and still still have the numbers because in this particular instance just one or two uh, makes a very big difference and, and and Aisha we can also wake up you know with situations where maybe some people from the majority side might be ill and they cannot be um, in parliament on a particular day when uh, matters are being discussed and the stakes are high, it will only take dialogue and negotiation uh, for, I mean, government business to pass through in instances like this. So the lesson here is we have, it looks like uh, almost lost one year. Um, they have done some work, but I believe uh, Ghanaians are not quite satisfied with uh, with what has transpired from January to now. You heard Dr. Rashid Ramani, he's executive director of the Africa Pal Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Now, parliament has been chaotic this year. Let's recap some incidents for you. And we start on the night of uh, January uh, 8th, uh, election of speaker of the 8th parliament. You saw um, how chaotic it was. Uh, you saw how... They exchanged blows in Parliament. There were military invasion. There's also approval of the 2022 budget, which happened recently. It was chaotic as well. Then last night, we witnessed the uh, approval of the 1.75% e-levy bill, which also saw majority and minority um, exchange blows. Now, we had a number of walkouts staged this year. Majority one and the minority one. More than 12 times walkouts staged by the minority between 2017 and 2021. We had the minority walking out more than 12 times. But in this year, they walked out once. Majority walked out once. Now, a key walkout staged by the minority, you have approval of the 2022 budget statement and economic policy of 2021. Minority staged a workout during approval of the controversial Japan Minerals Royalty Agreement 2020 
Minority MPs walked out of parliament moments before President Ekufuado delivered the 2020 State of the Nation address. That also happened last year. Minority MPs walked out of parliament as the House approved the budget of the Electoral Commission in 2019. The minority staged a walkout during the approval of Ghana-U.S. Defense Agreement 2018. Minority MPs staged a walkout over the Ameri deal in 2018. 17. Now, no e-levy certainly uh, has implications for government business, considering that government is projecting to raise 6.9 billion cities from e-levy by end of 2022. A portion of the proceeds from the e-levy, the finance minister explains, will be used to support entrepreneurship, youth employment, cybersecurity, digital and road infrastructure, among others. Meanwhile, Associate Professor of Finance at the Finance Department of the University of Ghana Business School says the e-levy is not the ultimate in generating revenue for government business. Government uh, is projecting that money uh, for a number of things. But uh, Professor Lord Mensa says um, there are other avenues government can generate revenue. It has economic implications, but... Uh... It does not mean that management of the economy has been halted, you know, completely. I mean, if we are to play by the numbers, um, clearly that six billion, seven billion that can be raised from the um, yield levy shouldn't stop government from running. Because um, if you look at our budget, government's indication of um, increasing revenue goes beyond the six billion. So if for nothing at all, Let's meet last year's target without the yield level. We, we should be able to run the country, I mean, as expected. It's good, I mean, to have parliament going on recess to do a thorough consultations and coming back. Um, I can tell you that we can still run this country without e levy or without e levy. So um, I don't see anything strange that will come up to say that uh, because of the e-levy, maybe workers are not going to be paid because of the e-levy. Maybe government might not get an excess, I mean, as expected. Let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic now. The head of the World Health Organization has recommended people cancel holiday gatherings as the Omicron COVID-19 variant continues to spread. Speaking at a news conference in Geneva, Dr. Tedros Adnam Ghebreyesu said, an event cancelled is better than a life cancelled. All of us are sick of this pandemic. All of us want to spend time with friends and family. All of us want to get back to normal. The fastest way to do this is for all of us leaders and individuals to make the difficult decisions that must be made to protect ourselves and others. All of us are sick of this pandemic. All of us want to spend time with friends and family. All of us want to get back to normal. The fastest way to do this is for all of us, leaders and individuals, to make the difficult decisions that must be made to protect ourselves and others. In some cases, that will mean cancelling or delaying events. Just as we have had to cancel the reception we plan to have with you today. But an event cancelled is better than a life cancelled. It's better to cancel now and celebrate later than to celebrate now and grieve later. Professor Gordon Awandari is director of West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens. He joins us shortly uh, on Zoom uh, for a conversation. Uh, Prof Awandari, I'm grateful for your time. Uh, what do you think? Should Ghana heed to the advice of WHO and cancel Christmas, or should we uh, celebrate Christmas in moderation? Good evening, Aisha. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, we need to moderate. Um, I know that it would be not realistic for us to um, uh, to say that we're cancelling everything, but I think we need to moderate. We need to scale back. Um, I know that a few weeks ago, 
um, things were looking much different. Um, but since the Omicron variant came around, uh, we see that uh, the cases are picking up. So we need to make adjustments. We need to scale back events, probably um, change venues for others, and put in measures to, to minimize the risk. So um, I, I have already suggested that we should put in place um, uh, you know, the options for people to test before getting into the events. Uh, we have rapid antigen tests that we can now deploy. So we need to do that and let people pay for these uh, tests before they can go to these events. Because it is very important that we try to minimize uh, the the height of the wave that uh, is coming. Mm. Let's understand the situation in which we are now, how dangerous it is. Well, it, it you know, if you if you look at what happened in the third wave, uh, you know, it, it tells you that, uh, uh, you know, this wave can also be as bad as the third wave and uh, we can lose uh, a number of lives. And also even um, uh, uh, what is more likely is the pressure that it will put on our health, our health uh, care facilities um, and the health care personnel. And whenever you have that much pressure on the health system, uh, you, you lose lives not only to COVID, but you also lose lives to other diseases that could have been um, better managed. And, and so you, uh, diseases that or deaths that could have been prevented if the system was not under pressure, uh, those deaths uh, may occur because uh, of pressure on the health facilities on, 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 and on the doctors. And so we, now, we know that there are a number of events lined up. People have planned how to celebrate their Christmas. Uh, there are so many activities that will be ongoing. Uh, what do you advise uh, that people do? They've already uh, planned these activities already. Well, uh, that's why I advise that we scale back and then we put in measures to minimize the spread. So... Um, we have to encourage vaccination. Um, I know that the government has put out a mandate or proposed a mandate to require people to be vaccinated before they can go to these events. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, do whatever is possible legally to make sure that that is enforceable. Um, then we need to really make the vaccines uh, easily accessible. We need to have vaccines everywhere. Um, I know some countries have done vaccination over 24 hour periods. So, you know, they just set up and for 24 hours are open for vaccination. People can go at whatever time is convenient for them. So we need to think about some of these measures. We need to be vaccinated every day, including Christmas day. We need to make sure that vaccines are available every day. Um, and then I think um, the Ghanaian people, we need to just appeal to the Ghanaian people that um, we didn't have vaccines before, and we are all complaining that uh, the government had not secured sufficient vaccines. Now we have a good quantity of vaccines in the country. Let's use the vaccines that we have. Let's not, um, you know, allow uh, this wave to to cause as much harm as the third wave did. We have the opportunity to minimize the uh, the impact of this wave if we vaccinate. If the vaccination coverage uh, goes up significantly. It means that hospitalizations would be minimized, which means that the pressure on the health system would be uh, less than before mm. or, or would be minimized. And which means that we will save more lives and you know, we can recover faster from the fourth wave uh, than we did from the third wave. Mm. Professor Windari, I'm grateful for your time this evening. He is the director for WACBIP at the University of Ghana. Uh, in the last few hours, there's been a statement coming from the police. I'll share with you uh, details of that statement. It's on law enforcement arrangement in parliament. It says, following the recent happenings in the House uh, during the 2022 budget debate, some concerned Ghanaians have questioned why the police did not go into the chamber to maintain law and order and take action against members of parliament who were seen engaged in what looked to many like violent disturbances and scaffolds in the chamber of parliament. 
Ghana Police Service wishes to draw the attention of the general public to the fact that, by Ghana's constitutional arrangement, security issues within the Chamber of Parliament are the responsibility of the Marshal to Parliament, who takes instructions from the Clerk of Parliament on such matters. The legal position is that police have no authority to enter the Chamber of Parliament to undertake any law enforcement venture. Any such act will be contravention of the laws of the country. We have, however, initiated steps to engage the clerk, marshal, and leadership of parliament to fashion out a more proactive way of supporting parliament in this regard within the confines of the laws of the country and is signed by ACP Kwesifori, Director General of Public Affairs. And still to come in business, financial analyst proposes 12.5% VAT charge on service fees charged by telcos and bank transfers in place of controversial e-levy. We'll hear from the Chief Finance Officer of Valley View University, Dr. William Spipra. And it's time for business. I'm Charles IIT. Financial analyst Dr. William Spipra is advising governments to rather consider charging a VAT of 12.5% of the service fees charged by the telcos and banks transfers in place of the 1.75% e-levy. According to him, this proposal shall increase the VAT amount by 7.5 billion cities, which is a 1.5 billion city shortfall of government estimate of 8.5 billion cities on the proposed e-levy. Speaking earlier on Business Live, Dr. Pepper believes that the VAT proposal will not be more problematic than the controversial e-levy charge. This is a major concern, and I think that uh, government should probably, if the 1.75 is a problem, must use the VAT law to, to bring that one in. And in that case, it will not be a major issue. If you listen to the minority, all they are saying is that the charge should not be on the transaction fee, but should rather be on the service fee charged by the telcos. So if government thinks that the 1.75 charge on the telcos Will, not give, um, will give them less than $1 billion. Then they should use a, a value-added tax rate, and then that will give them about $7.5 and which, which is almost close to the... In fact, um, in, in economics, if government applies this transaction on the, uh, on the transaction fee, Virtually, government is going to receive all monies in the country because for every single transaction done in the bank, which is electronic, electronically done, government is going to get 1.75. Also, all mo 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 mobile money transactions, government is going to get 1.75. So, uh -huh. in a cycle form, government is going to, by the, by the time we, we, we see, government would have collected all the monies in, in the system back into their, their, their coffers for their operation. That's why the focus or the attention right. should go on the service fee. Now, some banks have expressed optimism of an economic rebound in 2022, even better than witnessed in 2021 amid COVID-19. According to the managing director of Carl Bank, Philip Oredu, even though the pandemic brought some disruptions this year, the sector was able to surmount the pressure. He spoke to Joy Business at this year's staff Thanksgiving service organized by his outfit. Of course, we have more in this report. According to the Bank of Ghana's Banking Sector Developments Report, an assessment of the banking sector performance in 2020 showed that the industry somewhat withstood the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic on the back of strong policy support and regulatory reliefs. Managing Director of Carl Bank, Philip Oredu, said, considering measures being put in place, the bank will witness significant performance in the year 2022, even with the emergence of the Omicron variant. I think last year, COVID was, COVID was quite new to everyone. So in terms of uh, coming to terms with it, in terms of get, getting to know how to manage it, was quite a difficult one. Though we've had uh, a second wave in this country this year, uh, in terms of management of it, at least we, we learned from uh, the, the, the first wave that we had and we've been able to put, ensure that we put in place measures to, uh, for both customers and staff to be able to ensure that we, we, we are able to deal with it in terms of the ramifications of uh, COVID. So compared to last year, this year I would say that we've been able to manage this quite well. 
Meanwhile, sharing the bank's outlook for 2022, the Car Bank MD says his outfit will continue to improve on its retail banking as part of a three-year growth strategy. As an institution, we have our strategic in, in, in initiatives, and as I said, uh, we put together a three-year uh, strategy. And uh, the, the, the core of it is to ensure that, in terms of our retail uh, business, we expand our retail business. Our people are key to us. Technology is key to us. Our culture is is, is key to us. Risk management is, is key to us. So throughout this year, we've prosecuted quite a number of initiatives in terms of what we set for ourselves for the first year. We would reinforce all that we need to do uh, in 2022 and as I said the strategy is for a, a three-year period. This year's Cal Bank Staff Thanksgiving service featured the celebration of some dedicated staff for their long service. Now, the Chartered Institute of Markets in Ghana has renewed its commitment to support the government in developing policy and regulation for markets in Ghana. According to the Institute, there is the need to draw foreign attention to Ghana's vibrant democratic environment, a situation expected to boost foreign inflows. The president of the CIMG made this known at the 31st presidential ball organized by the Institute. This we are mandated to do under sections 3, a, B, and C of the Chartered Institute of Marketing Act 2020, Act 1021. It is imperative for CIMG under the Act to set the agenda for the practice of marketing, champion the role and value of marketing as a catalyst, as a critical tool for business development, and support government in the development of policy and regulation for marketing Ghana. It is our expectation at the end of the day that this theme will prompt Ghana as a corporate, as a body corporate, and all other units operating within, whether in the public or private sector, to actively work towards repositioning Ghana as a beacon of democracy, reasonably and relatively matured, compared to her peers, in order to attract the attention of the global investor community including tourism, tourists and leisure travelers to consider Ghana as their must-go-to destination in Africa. That will be it for business. We have sports coming up next with Nathaniel Atto to stay with us. Thanks for staying with us here on Joy News Prime. It's time for a big dose of sport. My name is Nathaniel Atto. Well, let's begin with the events of earlier today where Black Stars coach Milovan Ryavac named 30 men for his provisional squad for the 2021 Total Energies Africa Cup of Nations to be held in Cameroon. Now, the revelation was made earlier, uh, as I mentioned today, at a news conference at the Ghana FA's headquarters here in Accra. Here is the full squad. Well, important to note that the 30-man provisional squad also has uh, some... Three debutants in there, which includes two home base players, well, David Abagna of RTU and Maxwell Abekwe of Accra Great Olympics. Meanwhile, coach Milovan Bravat has justified his 30 man provisional squad. Uh, yes, Odlučili smo se za ovo listo, mislimo da je u ovom trenutku ovaj, je, trenutna lista u redu i naravno idemo, drugi, drugi step je idemo na pripreme i tu ćemo vidjeti i tim i kako i sve da se, ovaj, da se odradi za, za Afrika Kapanešu. Uh, not only last few days, the, the whole period behind us, maybe one, more than one month, was the only focus was on monitoring the players and assessing their form and finding the best solution. So it's never easy, you know. Many of them, they deserve to be here. So uh, to make decision like this is never easy. So we hope that, you know, this is the, the, the best uh, at this moment and that these guys are up. I'm absolutely, I absolutely believe these guys are ready to deliver and they are ready to fight for their country and to, to do the best they can. I am in my post, so I am always normal with the staff, we make decisions, we are normal, but we are normal, 
zadnje naše, niko nam se ne meša. Mislim da smo svi u dobrom šepu, da imamo zajednički cilj i da svako radi svoj posao. Tako da, normalno da ja radim svoj posao i da se sigurno niko ne meša u to, ali dobro je čuti sve, tako da... Nobody interfered my selection this time, not the same thing was in the past. Also, I always talk to my assistants and I talk to the people in the Federation. We always have fruitful discussions about something and, you know, we have good communications, but nobody is interfering at the end. I'm the responsible and I pick my team, so nobody put any pressure on me. So this. The uh, squad is the squad that I decided about together with my assistants. Black Stars coach Milovan Ravac uh, speaking through his interpreter, Nonad Glisic, known in football circles as Niche. Well, there's still more to share with you later on, but for now, Joe News Prime continues. My name is Nathaniel Atta, and I have love for sport. It's time for showbiz. My favorite Becky is here. Hello. My Dubai partner. Beautiful. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm good. So when was the last time you heard from Ifia, singer Ifia? My favorite, Your actually. Your favorite, Ifia. yeah. Um, it's been a while now. Exactly. The whole of this year looks like uh, she's been she's hiding. Been slow. Yeah, somewhere. Mm. And so I caught up with her uh, just, you know, uh, at Jackie's concert, okay. and she's been telling me the reason why she's been away for a very long time. She actually has a new music out. Okay. I know, you know the thing is, we're working on something amazing. Okay. And as soon as like it becomes what it is going to become, you guys are gonna love it. But you know, I'm playing almost all the shows. You, you, you so catch me. We're doing Beam, Rapaholic, Shata Wale. We're doing it all, cause you know, we're supporting our people. There's a lot of people in Ghana now, and we're giving them new music. I just dropped a new song with some Nigerians who are my brothers, so sorry. Um, go check out Heavy, it's on my timeline. Yeah, but now that we started, we won't stop. So more music coming. So that's just about it, yeah. But Aisha, uh, what's the hardest thing of being a public figure? <laughs> One million dollar question. Yeah. Um, the hardest thing, you always have to let your fans feel it's okay mm -hmm. even when it's not okay, not okay because you're supposed to be the one motivating them. Yeah. And so if you're down, you can't allow them to be down. So you have to be up all the time so yeah. they can be up with you. So another favorite of yours, Kofi Kinata, mm -hmm. uh, has been sharing with us uh, what's the hardest part of being a celebrity. Uh, what's the hardest part of being a celebrity, Kofi? <laughs> the fact that you have to satisfy everybody and the fact that you can't be yourself. Yeah, sometimes you can't be yourself and it's hard. Yeah. But there's a good side to it. God has given you a beautiful talent, but then there are you know, so many things that uh, comes as a good thing. Can you share that with me? Yeah, the, the good side, uh, some of the privileges that comes with it. Yeah. Sometimes, it, even in a queue, you, you, you will skip a queue. They will just come and sort you out and leave the rest. So we have privileges. You know, I agree with him 100%, trying to satisfy everyone. Everybody. Sometimes, I mean, people talk trash. Yeah. And you, really, 
you really want to give it back hard, but you can't do that. No, but you why, need to set I mean, why example. Why can't you be yourself and just give it back to them? It's it, no. They give it back to you. You that, give it back to that, them. That is why you need just to saying. always strike a balance. So yeah, Kofi Kinata is a great guy. Yeah, Are we still on twenty fourth? Yeah, we're still uh, going to Takradi on the twenty fourth. Uh, and I'll bring you all of that live here. Uh, but let's talk about another uh, fantastic musician, mm. um, Kwame Yuji. <laughs> Kwame Yuji, I'm so sorry. That's what happens Kwame, if you have a lot of sweethearts. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I caught up with Kwame Yuji at the GT concert uh, at the weekend, and we've been talking about, you know, the love that fans have for him. He actually had to take off... Uh, one of his necklaces, mm. you know, for, you know, one fan. Okay. And so when I caught up with, with him, I asked him, I mean, why would you go to that extreme? That is, yes. Uh, so uh, we had this conversation with Kwame. <laughs> It's just amazing how I'm, I'm loved and, and appreciated so much. So anytime I'm around people that love me so much, like, is I want to give something. I, 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 want, I want them to remember me for something. That I, I will practically give everything I have for the love they give me back because I appreciate it so much. How would you rate your 2021, Kwame? It's been, it's been perfect. You see how many hit songs? And, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, God is so good. God is so good how it happens to me all the time. So I think I'll say I'm favored and I'm being loved and I give glory to God. You know, I was listening to, you know, all your songs back to back, the ones that you featured uh, on other people's track and it's like all over the place. And I'm like, how do you even work around all these? It's quite some few bangers, huh? I think it's, it's the love, it's the love. I mean, how I pour my heart on every single song that I'm being featured on. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not selfish. I don't play partial when it comes to, I mean, working. I don't play with my work and I give you my all, regardless of it being my song, your song. And I, I mostly love to be in the studio with you so we can share ideas. Because, I mean, I, I, I think about the well-being of the song. It should blow. You can have a Kwame Eugene on, Kwame Eugene on your song and it's not a hit song. Like, I say, well, good man, as be sad. So we, we have to do it together. We have to make it work. Yeah. How, how is your December going? How busy is your December? Tell me. You can see, I mean, every... Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Monday, I mean, because I'm doing, I'm doing, I mean, corporate shows, I'm doing weddings, I'm doing end of year parties, I'm doing, I'm on every single big concert in the country. How and does that make you feel? I give glory to God, because, yeah, I mean, it's been a process from where I used to be till now, so I, I just have to give glory to God for this. So I give glory to God all the time. There are so many people out there, you know, uh, they, they won't allow uh, Kwame to move. I don't know if the, car can, if the camera can, you know, pan. But all these people, uh, what do you say to all these people? Uh, Merry, Merry Christmas, you know, just, you know, a message for these people out there. I would say, um, I mean, I love, the, I love the ambience, I love the support. And they should keep it coming because, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the job. The more it comes, the more, I mean, it urges me to work, so yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. right there. <laughs> so I shall Another be giving you guy. more of all these exclusives because you know uh, this December I'm and out and about. Crazy. And this evening is the BIM concert. I'll be there live. Mm -hmm. And so if you definitely is a BIM nation for you. Well, I'll try and see if I can join you, my favorite girl. Okay. Thanks for bringing us showbiz, and that will be I it shall. for showbiz. Welcome back to Journeys Prime to the rest of our stories. The minority caucus in parliament has dismissed claims. The Speaker Alban Bagwe has failed to demonstrate leadership in recent times. In the view of the NDC MPs, Mr. Bagwe has so far acted in the interest of the state, citing his decision to ignore the approval of the budget by a one-sided majority house as a move worthy of emulation. The NDC caucus also argue that unlike Alban Bagmin's predecessor, the current speaker has been balanced in the handling of the affairs of the House. This comment comes on the back of accusations by the Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Fenyo marking that the absence of the speaker in the chamber last night formed part of a grand scheme by the NDC to frustrate government business. 
at a press at a press conference today. Deputy Minority Leader James Kluchavegi urged Ghanaians to disregard the comments of the NPP side in the House. First thing that he said was that the Speaker of Parliament should show leadership. Um, we are surprised that the Deputy Leader, Honorable McCain, should be calling on the Speaker of Parliament to show leadership. We do not see anything that the Speaker of Parliament is doing uh, which shows that he is not showing leadership. In fact, if we want to talk about the Speakers of Parliament and in the immediate past Speaker of Parliament or the Seventh Parliament, as compared to the current Speaker of the Eighth Parliament, if we want to talk about who is showing leadership, it is Honorable Bagwin who is showing leadership. In fact, when Honorable Bagwin returned from his medical trip and where his deputy speaker, the first deputy speaker, uh, did all sorts of things to overturn the decision of parliament when the speaker was uh, around. If Bagwin is somebody who is not showing leadership, he would have reversed all those wrongs that were done by the first deputy speaker. But for the fact that he wanted the country to move on, uh, he only said that he is not going to do anything to turn or overturn those uh, decisions. And that shows somebody who is showing leadership. So for Afanyo Makin to say that Gagwin should show leadership, we are surprised and we want to tell the whole world that Gagwin is uh, an experienced former member of parliament. In fact, the only person who has served the parliament of Ghana as a member of parliament for 28 good years. We had all the experience from the first parliament to the seventh parliament. And we are fortunate to have him as a speaker of the eighth parliament, where he's putting before the entire country his experience as a, as a member of parliament, a former member of parliament. So everybody should disregard all the comments about Afanyo Makin in relation to the leadership style of Mr. Speaker, Honorable Bagwin. Now, he also say that uh, Honorable Bagwin's absence uh, yesterday was a deliberate act to frustrate the business of government. That is a complete lie. It is never true. We all know that Honorable Bagwin just returned from Dubai, where he went to undergo a lot of medical treatment. And he must obey the instructions and directive of, of his doctors, because his life is very important. So if on Friday, before the House should uh, adjourn to Monday, we all agree as a House, leadership of the House agree that Monday we are coming solely to do the business of e -levy. So. The House was scheduled to start sitting at 10 a.m. on Monday, yesterday. But we all saw what happened. The House ended up starting around 4, 5 p.m. And Mr. Speaker, somebody who is now about to rest enough so that he can regain his uh, health, you cannot put him through all these issues for him to go through all these hazards wasting and sitting for long. So when the house eventually sat, we all saw the business that they were tabling, completely different from the e-levy that was scheduled for the day. I mean, the speaker cannot stay on beyond certain hours in the chamber. And that is why, after sitting for some few hours, he called for the first deputy speaker to take the chair for him to go and rest. And when the house was on, Suspension, reconvening also took a longer time. Mr. Speaker could not stay on at the disadvantage of his health in order to ensure that you, the leaders of the House, leaders of government business, who should table the e levy, which is very important for you, to put it aside and be doing other things. So for him to say that Honorable Bagwin's absence was deliberate is also. Not true. So I want to put it out there that Afonio Marking cannot peddle lies about the speaker, 
that he was absent because it was a deliberate act to frustrate the business of the, the House. In the last few hours, the Christian Council has been issuing a statement and making their stance on this matter in Parliament. I'll read excerpts for you. Uh, it says the leadership of the ecumenical bodies in Ghana is deeply concerned about the conduct of parliamentarians in recent times. The latest example happened yesterday, Monday, December 20, on the floor of Parliament when voting on whether or not the uh, treat. Uh, to treat the proposed e-levy and the certificate of agency turned into a chaotic sin. Parliamentarians are respected and honourable people in society and should not continue to act in ways that will rescind the honour bestowed on them by the nation. We respectfully remind parliamentarians that debates in parliament must remain a platform for the exchange of ideas and not an opportunity for confusion and hostility. Ghanaians voted for you to engage in debates, not boxing. Uh, we therefore urge Parliament to, as a matter of urgency, build consensus to ensure that the nation has budget to work with in 2022. We also urge the leadership of Parliament to put measures in place to prevent any future incidents of mayhem. Christian leaders in our country will continue to pray for our legislators for God's grace and wisdom at all times. We ask for God's blessings upon the House of Parliament. May God bless our nation, Ghana, and is signed by Reverend Professor uh, J.O.Y. Mante, and for all in behalf of the leaders in Ghana. Director of Health Promotion at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Dacosta Abuaje, says Ghanaians have started opening up to taking the coronavirus vaccines. He reveals that over 20% of Ghana's population have received at least one jab, while 10% of the total population have had the double dose. So I know that uh, a lot of people are now uh, ready to take the vaccines, but yet there is a little bit of hesitancy. But I mean, our strategy has been to obviously use what we call the social mobilization approach. So for example, if you look here today, the GFA told us that a lot of people will be coming here to their premises. So we decided that, okay, then we will bring our mobile team here to vaccinate those people who will be coming here, those without uh, who have not already been vaccinated. And since we came, the patronage has actually been very good. A lot of people, uh, as you can see, um, a lot of people are getting vaccinated. And um, some people had already had their first shot, and we've given them their second shot. Some have also received the uh, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so it's good. But bear in mind that the GFA themselves have also announced that uh, come January, should you not have the vaccine or the vaccine card or if you are not vaccinated you will not be able to enter their premises in terms of their various stadia so what we have done is with um we in partnership with them uh we've we we've linked them to our regional health directorates our district health directorates and vaccination exercises are going on in the various stadia now in january too we will still be working with them so if you are going to the stadium for example, and you are not vaccinated, they will direct you to uh, some of our centers, like uh, we'll set a center here and um, a stadium clinic so that they are able to, uh, we we able to still vaccinate people. All right, so can you like estimate the number of uh, citizens you have been able to vaccinate ever since you started? Okay, thank you. So as of yesterday, it was 6.9 million Ghanaians. So um, it representing about 10% uh, of the population having um, the being fully vaccinated and 20, 20 I think it's about 25.9 having at least a shot. Managers of a mobile money business in Bantama in Kumasa, which was robbed at gunpoint during rush hour in April this year, are pleading with the police to be honest in their investigations. The victims of the robbery who lost at least 142,000 Ghana cities are unhappy with how the police has been handling the incident. They claim no one has been arrested, contrary to earlier police announcements of arresting two suspects connected to the robbery on him interior of our security desk, Hasmo. Gang wearing robbers on motorbikes left residents in Kumasi in shock 
asked the brazenly strike at the shop in full public glare on April 21, 2021. The robbers were captured on CCTV packing several bundles of Ghana City notes into plastic bags as they took the workers hostage in an oppression that lasted less than five minutes. The robbery operation happened a few hours after the owner of the shop, Yabwache Dankwa, had withdrawn 241,000 CDs from the bank for the day's transactions. Agents, you know, omu omu a chichi, you know, so we have physical money, our day mobile money now. Oh, by me, or Namma, my boy, or more physical money. On Tina Macaco is can or Eco Bank. That is two hundred and forty one thousand. At it is can you two billion four hundred and ten million. Tis other than one on Bajiska. But two months after the incident, the police announced the arrest of two suspects who were also linked to similar mobile money robbery at Bookroom Estate in June. We had video. Footages. Public relations officer for the Ashanti Regional Police Command, ASP Godwin Ahiyanyo, broke the news to Joy News in an interview. Bantama robbery incident and that of Vukrum, they are very similar. So it tells you that it is this very syndicate who perpetrated that crime. Because in the CCTV footage, we've identified one person who was involved in the earlier two cases. Two of them have been arrested. We are looking for other persons. And I'm sure we, be, you, we are going to use those two to get the others. The victims of the robbery, however, doubt the arrest, claiming the attempts to see their suspects have proved futile six months after police announced the arrest. Ebenezer Amamu is in charge of operations at Osuyeni Boachi Ventures. We were robbed on 21st of April, and now we are in December. The policemen told us that we will come and identify the robbers. That was about some four months ago. But we are still in December, but nothing has been done about it. The impact of the robbery on Mr. Amamu and others who were robbed at gunpoint on that fateful day has been adverse. Managers have been forced to reduce the number of working hours whilst workers continue to live in fear. The feeling is not a very good one at all. Because to be at work doing your thing and by the time you raise your head, you will see a gun pointing at you, ordering you to pack all your money and give it to someone who hasn't even worked for it. It's not a very good thing at all. It has caused some phobia in me, especially when I'm there and I hear a motorcycle making a noise around. I always think that maybe it, it might be some of those people who are moving around. And even when you are at work, there is this panic that rises in you. The moment you re remember the incident, it causes some fear in you. And not me alone, my other colleagues too. Now, the time we used to close, we have limited it due to the robbery case. The Ashanti Regional Police Command has dismissed claims by the victims. Command officials say two suspects, Hamza Suli and Farouk Ibrahim, are currently standing trial at the Nkari Circuit Court from Kumasi, for Joy News, I'm Interior reporting. Residents in the Akachi North District capital, Ave Adakpa, uh, have been bearing the brunt of an acute shortage of potable water. They have resorted to water bodies in the agrarian community with the majority traveling to fetch the Ave Dakba Crocodile Dam, a tourism facility in the Volta region. This follows the disconnection of power to the community water system due to the non-payment of 12,629 cities water bill. There's more in the following report by the Volta region correspondent, Fred Kwame Asare. After battling with the challenge of access to potable water for decades, Elders of Avedakwa in the Kachino district of the Volta region deemed it fit to solve initiate a water project. Through pool funding by the community, the then Akache District Assembly and the Danish International Development Agency, the Avedakwa water system was constructed to serve the agrarian community in 2003. The facility was operational until 2019 when it was disconnected for non payment of electricity bills. Some politicians heard of the plight of the people. So one Dr. Senanu Agumenu came to the rescue of the people by donating 4,000 Ghana cities. 
uh, we have been told the assembly also added all that they were owing, the 5,100 Ghana cities, they also added 2,000 Ghana cities to it to make it 6,000, which they took to electricity company at Denu and begged. They pleaded with the people and then they restored the uh, water again. Following the restoration of power, the Akachi North District Assembly took over management of the water system, hence dissolving the community water board in February 2019. However, the facility again ran into debt under the management of the assembly. The Avedakpa pump station was subsequently disconnected as it owes 12,629 Ghana cities as of October 2021. The assembly started collecting the money. They, elect, they, they selected their own person who was going around collecting money from the collection points and then the houses. But the, 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 the ECG people too have disconnected because we are still owing again. We are still owing. Uh -huh. But the, 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 crux, the crux of the, uh, the, the, the problem is the, the, the old age of the machines, some of the pipes which need to be changed. Residents were therefore compelled to fall back to use water from the Avedakma Crocodile Dam, which serves as a tourism facility. Both male and female, young and old, journey here to fetch water for domestic use. Unfortunately, wastewater from the community streams into the dam, making the water unwholesome. We are in a pandemic era, so it is unsafe and unhealthy for wastewater from bathrooms and houses to be channeled into the dam. The old, poor and vulnerable in the community rely on water from the dam for drinking and cooking. Angela Ayensu Ayele and her family traveled to the bank of the dam on Saturdays to wash their clothing due to their unavailability of water. She laments they have been enduring the situation for over six months, likewise other residents of Avedakpa. Though my house is far, I have come here to wash my clothing because there is no water in the community. The water system stopped functioning about six months ago. We rely on the water from the dam for cooking, drinking and washing, all because we do not have any other source of water. We solely rely on the dam for cooking and drinking. We don't have any other source of water in this community. The residents fear a continuous reliance on unwholesome water from the dam may affect their health. We are appealing to all in Sandwich to come to our aid so our children can get water to drink because water is life. Some opinion leaders are proposing that the community takes over management of the water system from the district assembly. We want to manage our own thing. But if assembly refuses to allow us to take over the facility, we will go on the street and the, the whole world will hear of us. They will demonstrate. We shall resist fiercely. And secondly, too, we will make sure that this facility must be well kept. As a, uh, as a property, real property of the community. Until the debt is paid and power restored to the pump station, residents would continue to rely on unwholesome water from the Avedakma Crocodile Dam. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Avedakma. We'll take a break on Joy News. When we return, there's more business and sports. Hi there, I'm Charles Aita with Business. The Chief Executive of the National Youth Authority, Pius Hadjidje, has revealed that as part of the efforts to support the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, his outfit intends to focus on the economic development of young entrepreneurs. He made this known at the Ghana Startup Network's fifth Young Entrepreneurs Summit organized in Accra. The summit sought to create an enabling platform for Ghanaian youth women and young entrepreneurs to be sensitized on the various protocols of AFCFTA and to discuss the strategy by national institution to facilitate trading beyond borders. Speaking to Joy Business, Pius Enam Hajide indicated that his outfit will pay keen attention 
to the economic progress of youth entrepreneurs. We have decided that we must pay attention and some focus on the economic strand of development. And, and we believe that that will create the jobs. It will change young people from job seekers to job creators. Chief Executive of Maslock, Hajia Abibata Shani Mahama, on her part, outlined some financial and access packages her outfit is currently running to support youth, women, and young entrepreneurs. You can take the small loan from 5,000 Ghana cities to 200,000 Ghana cities at the CU's level. But any amount beyond 200,000 Ghana cities, it has to go to the board. We are open to every Ghanaian citizen 18 years and above. So once you come to Maslow, what we require from you are your bank statements, registration documents, SIN number, and in some cases, collateral. But for the youth, we are looking at a way that we can do a waiver on the collateral. For example, when the youth want to start businesses, they may not necessarily have collateral. So what do we do in place of collateral? So it's something that we are into discussion. However, Solomon Eje, Executive Director, Ghana Startup Network, has urged institutions to put their words into actions. So we'll put ourselves together as young people. We'll test the system and see how it works. I mean, we, we, we it's not, not like we are testing, but then we'll, we'll apply it to the system and see if it really gives us what we need as young people. And we believe that with the word that they've given us today, they will, they will walk by their talk to make sure that the young people get the benefit they need to get to trade beyond borders of Ghana. In a bid to improve electricity access to Sierra Leone, government has sent a delegation led by its Vice President Dr. Mohamed Jalo to Ghana to meet institutions in the energy sector. Of course, Sierra Leone, with 31% energy access, has challenges in the area of generation, transmission and distribution and government, but is ready to learn from Ghana to improve the situation. Dr. Mohamed Jalo disclosed this when the delegation visited the Ghana Grid Company in Tema, where correspondent Kwame Yanka has more in this report. This was the second time a high-level delegation from Sierra Leone was visiting Gridco following an earlier one led by the country's president, Julius Madabu. Sierra Leone currently has challenges in the area of power generation, transmission and distribution, and governance, but is ready to learn from Ghana. For the delegation, the visit was even more important as the country is part of the agreement between Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea to undertake the CLAG transport project, which spans over 1,300 kilometers to export power from Cote d'Ivoire. Vice President Dr. Mohamed Jude Jalo says there is a the need to continue investing in energy. The energy sector is a priority to Sierra Leone government for several reasons. As a government that wants to open up its sectors, as a government that wants to open up its country, as a government that wants to attract foreign direct investment, as a government that wants to bolster the productive sector, it is but very important that we focus and invest enormously in the energy sector. We have been doing that progressively under the leadership of the Honorable Minister of Energy, Dr. Alaji Kanja Sise. When we came in, Energy access in Sierra Leone was 16%. Today, three years down the line, we are 31%, and we, need, and we know that we still need to do more. Meanwhile, Chief Executive Officer of Gridco, Ebenezer Sienyi, says the collaboration provides an avenue to share experience and information. Things that we went, we are ready to guide you in any aspect of our, our works. The traps that we fell in, what we learned, what is it that we must do going forward? Then also, based on our knowledge of the industry, for you, based on the Transco CLSG project and the need for you to acquire the knowledge in terms of planning, maintenance, we are ready. You just need to call on us and we'll gladly come and assist your, your team in certain things up. With respect to the compact, we have done our successfully. Lucky for us, we had major grant component of it that we use for uh, two big substations in Ghana. I believe you visited there and therefore it's something that if you happen to be willing to let us help in any way possible, just let us do that. 
The VIP expressed gratitude to management and staff of Gridco, government and other state agencies assisting his country in the power sector. President of the Canada Ghana Chamber of Commerce, Alexander Norti, says the Chamber will scale up trading activities between Ghana and Canada next year. According to him, trading activities are dipped due to COVID-19, but new challenges will be deployed next year. At the commissioning of the Canada Ghana Chamber of Commerce new edifice at Laboni in Accra, it entreated its members to be proactive in trading with Canada. Members of the association were also asked to take full advantage of the existing opportunity to develop a close relationship and bilateral trade. We are celebrating the opening of our new offices here in Laboni. We're looking to promote business between Canada and Ghana. So basically we've invited all our members here to, to, to witness the opening of our new offices. Well basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to get Ghanaian businesses to meet Canadian businesses as well. We do a lot of trade, trade missions and seminars, traveling to Canada and so forth. So ideally we inform the local businesses of what activities are going on in Canada. Well, we, feel that we felt that we needed to give our members a lot more value for money because uh, there's a membership subscription. So therefore, we wanted, we have offices here where uh, we provide business services for our members. So it's, we're offering a little bit more to them. Because we've been hampered by the COVID over the past few years, we're trying to create, step up our activities, our trade missions, and trying to co-op more members to do business with Canadian co companies. Canada as well has been a bit slow because of the COVID, but now we're trying, they're opening up and we're trying to do more with the Trade Commission of Canada. The Canada Ghana Chamber of Commerce seeks to promote the interests of its members. James Ishan's report for Joy Business. That will be it for business, but I will leave you with international business summary after which we have sports. Just stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Let's do some boxing now. And WBO Junior Lightweight Champion, uh, I'm talking about the WBO Africa Junior Lightweight Champion, Joshua Oluwashehuni Wahab, is in the final stage of preparations ahead of his December 26 defense of his title. There's more in this Joy Sports report. Joshua Wahab trains day and night, fine-tuning preparation for his title defense on Christmas Day. He is the current holder of the WBO Africa Junior Lightweight title. Wahab is impressed with his fitness level ahead of the big bout. My fitness level is 100%. You know, even I can say maybe one around 20% because, you know, I don't wait for them to give me five before I start prepare, you know, I always get myself always ready, 100%. So, you know, me doing this thing today, just like I'm just doing training, you know, I'm ready. If they say the fight is tomorrow, I'm ready. 
Joshua Wahab expects a tough test as he comes up against Tanzania's Jackson Malayingi on December 25. I, you know, I respect every boxer, you know. There's no boxer that puts in front of me that on that it. You know, he's a very good boxer, you know. I always, I watch a couple of his fights on YouTube and I can see he's a very sharp guy. So we've worked on him, me and my team. Um, the work is done already. The bout is being put together by Ace Power Promotions. Isaac Eduamankwa is general manager. Um, for boxing fans who were, who were at our event on the 16th of October, they realized that we produce some of the best fights in town. And our parents are always mouth-watering. This time is not an exception. Uh, we have put together one of the best parents you can ever find. And it's a WBO junior lightweight title defense. And as you saw Olu Hashan Wahab display here, it tells you that he's ready, he's in good shape. And we expect boxing fans to come and enjoy. We have put together a very exciting package and we are ready to entertain them on Christmas Day. Um, we expect that the event will be very long, to be very, very short, but full pack with exciting fights on the night. <laughs> some pace right there, isn't it? Well, let's continue with some more boxing. This time, the amateur ranks and the head coach of Ghana's national amateur boxing team, the Black Bombers, Ufuri Afari, believes that preparations for next year's Commonwealth Games should begin immediately. Coach Asari led Ghana to its first Olympic medal in 29 years, guiding Samuel Tichi to a bronze medal at the Olympic Games, which ended in Tokyo, Japan, earlier this year. Definitely, the preparation for the Commonwealth Games to begin now, it, it, should, it should even start now from the club level because most of the times there are some informations that we need to uh, make sure that uh, we blow it all over the places. We must let the boxers know that there is a Commonwealth Games coming up. The clubs must know that there is a Commonwealth Games coming up. If you have boxers who are good, start preparing them from the club level. So before they come to the national level, at least they have something in them already. And then we continue from that, and then we get to the uh, Commonwealth Games, and then we win medals. So preparation, not only waiting for the national team, but the club level, the club coaches. The coaches, I believe in them. I know that we got this bronze because of their work as well, because most of the coaches even uh, 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 come to uh, support us during our training. And so they should start now at the club level so that we may have uh, 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 very, uh, 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 very uh, a very very tricky way of selecting the national team because it will be that we will have a lot of equals which we have to select from a lot of equals to be able to get uh, our best. When we, we selected Samuel Techi, there are equal bosses like Samuel Techi. John Comey, the late John Comey, was very very good like Samuel Techi. May so rest in perfect peace. Uh, there's a whole lot of them also there. Some of them have to go to professional, not because that they are not, they are, they, 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 can't do, they are not good, but some of them, they are equal to the boxers who are in the national team. They are equally good like them, but we still have to select one. We still have to select one. You can't select all of them. So that is the reason why some of them, they go to professional. We see them, we know that they are good boxers, but there's nothing you can do. You have to select one. So we select Samuel Techi out of many Samuel Techis. We select Samuel Techi out of many Samuel Techi, and uh, uh, Samuel Techi is able to go there to prove it. So if Samuel Techi is able to win at the Olympic level, it tells you that those Samuel Techi we left behind can also win when they get the opportunity to go there. So we have to work very hard, like I said, to create more baking pans to be able to get there. Well, coach of the National Amateur Boxing Team, the Black Bombers, Euphoria Sari, in that earlier conversation with me. They're wrapping it up for sport for today. You can uh, click on the sports page of myjoyonline.com for more stories. You can also uh, get on some of our digital channels on Instagram and on Twitter, as well as Facebook for more. That's it for now. My name is Nathaniel Atto, and I have love for sport. And as I draw the curtains on the news tonight, my name is Aisha Brian. For more news, log on to myjohnline.com. We have updates of all the developing stories.